All right, welcome everyone. My name is Monica McCubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission uh, located in the Lincoln office. So uh, today we are going to be talking about night sky ecology. So this is a topic that I'm not going to um, lie to you was kind of uh, tough this week to find some information on it. So um, I did my best to find as much as I could and um, really tried to focus it in on Nebraska. But a lot of the information I found for one, it was hard to find information on this topic, um, a lot of information on this topic, but then also it was very hard to find Nebraska specific things. So I did my best. So we will be talking a little bit more about kind of just some night sky ecology and animals in the world, but then I will relate it to Nebraska as much as possible. So I know we have quite a few people that are from Nebraska on today, but then we also have from people from other states as well. So we will do our best to um, relay that information. We're going to be talking about um, how animals use the night sky, um, how people have used it in the past, how animals use it. There's been a few really good studies done as far as how um, animals use different parts of the stars or use the Milky Way. Um, and then we're also going to talk about light pollution. So that is a huge component of our dark skies. Um, so we're going to go into that a little bit and then also talk a little bit about the moon as well. So it is a full moon tonight. Um, it's called the Sturgeon Moon. It's one of the last, it is the last super moon of the year. So really interesting. Make sure you go out and see that tonight. So, all right, we will go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen for all of you here. All right, here we go. All right, so here is our science of night sky ecology. All right, so if you've done, um, let some people in here. If you've done a science of before, you kind of know how it goes, please feel free to answer, ask questions in the chat. Uh, just make sure that they are on topic and relevant to what we're talking about and everyone is kind to each other. Otherwise, we do have the opportunity to remove you. Um, I also want to point out to everybody, I am by no means an expert in night sky ecology. I'm no, by no means any expert in any of the topics or uh, themes that I've been doing. I do a lot of research for them. Um, I've had over 10 years of experience in um, outdoor education, so I'm doing my best. If there are questions that you um, ask that I cannot answer or um, no one else can answer, I will find someone that can answer them for you and get back to you as soon as I can. So um, please feel free to ask questions and have good discussions in the chat while we're going. Um, but just know also that I am by no means an expert. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the, the history about how humans started using the stars and how animals kind of transitioned into that. Um, and that's funny that I say how, you know, we did it first. Clearly we did not. Um, but animals have been doing this for a very long time. Um, people have just kind of, um, kind of scratched the surface as far as just beginning to use them. So, all right, so historically, as far as people go, um, we've been using the stars, we've been using the galaxy, the night sky to navigate, and that's probably not news to anybody, um, but it is critically important for people and for humans. Um, this has helped us basically navigate through our earth. Um, every, you know, we didn't have Google Maps and we didn't have um, printed versions of atlases forever. Um, we had to use something else and that was the night sky. It was the stars, it was the glow, it was everything. So um, when it was dark and the night sky, um, the stars basically gave people light. Um, that is what they used. And we we also need to remember the most important sun or the most important star is the sun. Um, it gives life to all earth. We would just be a rock with ice if we did not have the sun. So we also have to remember that the sun is in fact a very large star. Um, when people talk about the night sky, they've used it in many different poems, they've used it in different um, stories and abstracts, they've used it in commercials, they've used it in movies and everything that goes back for a very long time. They use words like forever and hope and destiny, freedom, all of those different things when they are talking about the stars. Um, many people also believe that if you falling stars, um, when they talk about falling stars, you know, it makes wishes come true. So there's a lot of different historical value, but then also um, 
sometimes that um, imagination that comes with it as well. Um, ancient sailors used to use the star to help them guide while at sea. Um, my daughter's a huge Moana fan. So if anyone has seen Moana out there, they actually do a very good, accurate job in Moana talking about how they use the stars and how those voyagers um, navigated through the waters. All right, so as early as about 5,000 years ago, people, the very, very first astronomers that were ever around, they really started noticing changes in the sun and the moon. They would be in different positions. They would have different brightness levels. There was differences about them. Um, they looked at patterns in how the sun rises, how the sun sets, um, the shape and the position of the moon um, on any given evening or any given day. Um, so humanity was not only inspired by that beauty of the sky, um, but they also followed those changes and that is what really helped them understand when it was time to harvest or when it was time to um, hunt or when was the best time to find certain animals or see things bloom. So that is really what they relied on. Um, and they also figured out which constellations um, and they named a lot of those constellations and many of those we still use those same names today. It also helped preserve cultures and was an ancient storytelling technique. So they've been around, it's been a part of our culture for a very long time. All right, um, I'm sure this is very familiar to a lot of people. Um, people often built these shrines or what they call henges um, that told them of those key astrological moments, um, basically like the summer and the winter solstices and the spring and fall equinoxes. So um, I'm sure a lot of us know this is Stonehenge. Um, so this is one of the most famous places to see these um, like calendar um, places and um, understand how um, ancient people would use these to figure out when time it was, when the fall, when the spring was, different seasons. Um, so basically people soon realized that some constellations also, like the Big Dipper is one that we're all pretty familiar with, um, they're only seen in certain parts of the sky. Um, so certain parts that we don't see um, are also help for, helpful for those people as well. Um, it also helped the voyagers navigate and correctly identify where they were and where they wanted to go. And when we talk about a henge, Stonehenge is one of the most famous, um, but it does not have to be this complex. It could be basically a circle in a ditch. It could be a big mound. It could consist of stone or logs. It basically just has to define that circle. So, and these have been around for a very long time. All right, so a famous star that we are probably all familiar with, we've read about it in books, we've seen about it in movies, is the North Star or the Pole Star. Um, a lot of people will refer to it as the Pole Star or Polaris. So um, basically that name Polaris, it was introduced in about the 18th century and it's a Latin, new Latin word for stellar Polaris, which means Pole Star. And we've kind of come to call it the North Star. Um, so the Pole Star, when we talk about this, it is lined up with the Earth axis. Um, because of its position over what we call the North Pole, um, it is the only star that does not move. So it's very important for orientation and navigation. Um, a lot of people believe that it's the brightest star in the sky. It is very bright, but it's not the brightest star. It's about the 50th <laughs> brightest star. Um, the Sirius is the, the brightest in the sky, um, but it's located nearly at the North Celestial Pole, and it's the point where, where the entire North sky turns. So this was, a, again, very important for navigation, and a lot of um, animals, we'll talk about a certain one, they use these things called the um, like loading stars, and it is basically one of those that um, it's very identifiable, they can find it in the night sky, and it helps that it does not move. All right, so that was just a little bit about night sky ecology and how humans have used it, and just a little kind of a background information. So now I want to go ahead and talk about how animals use this, um, and I don't see anything in the chat, so we will go ahead and keep moving. All right, so it is no, oh, I just saw something in the chat. <laughs> Um, I'm an amateur astronomer on the board of directors. Branch Joke Observatory is a good kept secret in Nebraska. All right, so perfect. They have star parties every month. This is a great thing to check. So thank you. Is it David that posted that? Thank you, David. Um, that's nice to know. All right, so talking about animals and how they use the night sky. Um, so besides humans, we know that animals use it, um, but it's actually a very understudied um, 
it's an understudied thing. We're not exactly sure why, we're not exactly sure how. There's been some studies done, but it's actually really, it's a hard thing to make a study to do. Um, so there's a number of different animal species that we know use the stars as sort of a directional tool, um, but they use it for other things as well. Um, knowing when to migrate, um, when to migrate, um, where to migrate, the um, different times that animals will come out at night versus staying inside. Um, and also the information that animals take from the sky is just a hard thing to gather. We can't be inside their mind. We don't know what they're looking for when they look up at the night sky. Um, it's something that field biologists and astronomers have worked together for a very long time. And we've only really like dipped the surface about how much we know and how much animals use that. Um, so like I mentioned, very little is known. Um, it also takes into account um, animals take these dim light points and make it into a reliable orientation that's really difficult to assess. So again, it's, it's understudied. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't want to know information. It's just very difficult to get that information. All right, so we do know that some animals will use this as the stars or the night sky as an orientation cue. So basically after the moon has set, nighttime animals are left with only the stars. There's hopefully, um, we'll talk about this later, very little light out there, um, but these points gradually move because stars move as a function of the latitude, the date, and they follow a pretty a similar schedule to that of the solar day. And when I talk about a solar day, that just basically means the time based on the position of the sun. So any of you people that can look up at the sky and say it is 2.30, <laughs> that's a skill that a lot of people don't have. Um, the movement of planets, um, we once, um, biologists once thought that they used, animals use this as well, but it's not very reliable because planets move and they're in different places all the time. Um, stars do as well, um, but it's a smaller movement. It's not um, as, as much. So. Um, so one thing we want to know is why do animals perform different behaviors during the darkest part of the night? So we will do a little bit on nocturnal animals here, but basically some species that come out during the nighttime, they benefit from that reduced competition. They are usually fewer predators out at night and there's fewer parasites out at night. So they're less likely to become sick. They're less likely to get eaten and they're less likely to have to compete with another species. So there's also usually a drop in temperature at night and that helps with significant movement and foraging. So um, especially right now, at least here in Nebraska, in the summer, it's very hot outside. A lot of animals will actually change their behavior because it is so hot, they don't want to go outside. Um, they will change their behavior to become more nocturnal. And then usually when the weather kind of cools, they will change again and go back to coming out during the daytime if they're mostly diurnal or those night or those daytime animals. All right, so there are some species um, that synchronize their behavior with those orientation cues. So um, night migrating birds, they're more likely to take off with the setting sun. Um, so that is their cue. Okay, the sun is starting to set, it is time to get going. Um, basically they calibrate their internal magnetic compasses and they use the stars as an established heading to get to where they're going. Um, sweat bees, ground spiders, and ants also use a similar strategy, but they mostly just use the stars to know when to leave their nest at night to go forage. So these are not animals that are migrating long distances, but they're using it for a different orientation. They're knowing when to go outside and eat. All right, so when we think of the stars, um, on a moonless night, this basically becomes a very limiting factor for that celestial orientation. So um, there's definitely two different types of animals out there. There's animals that are what we have called camera eyes, which is kind of what we have, kind of more um, high-tech eyes. And then there's animals out there that have what we call compound eyes. Um, so basically there's definitely, if you have, let's say a fox and you have a beetle, those are two very different types of things that they are seeing with their eyes at nighttime. So um, the animals that have these camera eyes, they're more likely to know, okay, this, I can see a star very clearly, or I can see this orientation very clearly. If you're a beetle, you don't see those individual stars, but you more likely look for the luminous pattern. So how bright is it? Where is that light the brightest? Um, and the intensity gradient. So basically they're looking at that general feature of what the sky looks like. So 
sometimes is limiting for different animals, but that doesn't mean that they still don't do the same thing. They still use the night sky as an orientation. So we'll talk about dung beetles here in a second. Um, they use the Milky Way as their orientation, whereas certain night migrating birds or birds will use a certain star or rotation in the sky as their pinpoint area. All right, so speaking of night migrating birds, um, they will use a strategy, like I mentioned, based on the sky's rotation. So this orientation strategy could be used at any hour of the night. And one of the first birds that they found that did this, there was a study on indigo buntings, which we actually have here in Nebraska. Um, but they took these birds to a planetarium and they had them basically, um, they wanted to see if they looked at different stars individually for migrating, or if it was just a pattern of the brightness, they had no idea. Yet, so they wanted to figure this out. So they took them to a planetarium to do the study on them, and they wanted to see what their orientation strategy was. Um, they found that they didn't really need to see individual stars, but rather the rotation of the star pattern around a center point. So in the wild, this basically helps them detect north and they can use that for migration. Um, they're not gonna be exactly dead on north every single time, but they're looking for that rotation around a single area that helps them figure out the general, very close direction where to go. So for instance, the stars like close to the pole star, they move the slowest, and then they can basically trace the path of a small circle around that star. Um, and then they use that basically as a map to guide them at night. Um, it's their compass basically. So um, this is how they do it. Um, not all animals will do it the exact same way, but indigo buntings were kind of the first bird where they really took this and made that study. And this was a huge thing that they found out. All right, we talked about dung beetles earlier. This one I think is super interesting to me because this animal has a brain the size of a grain of rice and they can do all the stuff that I'm gonna to talk to you here about. But this behavior, um, I mentioned earlier that there's compound eyes versus camera eyes. So compound eyes would be like your beetles or your insects among others. But for the instance in this, we're gonna talk about dung beetles. Um, these guys, they have, um, there was a really studied behavior done in this that they use the Milky Way as orientation to figure out where to roll their dung. Um, so basically the males and the females will construct and transport um, a dung ball um, to their nest or to their area. It might be underground. It could be to a different location. It could be used as a mating tool. It kind of depends on the species of dung beetles, but males and females will usually do that together, but they need to know where to go. So they will use those celestial cues. In this case, it is the Milky Way um, to basically maintain their initial heading and it prevents them basically from going in a circle. So they want to make sure they know where to go. Um, they do have compound eyes, so they can't um, identify individual stars, but instead they use the light that comes from the Milky Way to know the correct direction to go. Um, they also um, are the only known insect to orient by the galaxy. So um, there might be others that we just don't know about, um, but they're the only ones that we know that look at the entire Milky Way galaxy. Um, they also navigate using polarization patterns in moonlight. So just like um, during the day, the sun, when it hits particles, it will scatter. Same thing at night, the moonlight will hit particles and it will strike a different um, brightness or a different polarization pattern. They go off of that as well. And again, they can do all this and they have this size, they have a brain the size of a grain of rice. So it's pretty impressive that they, um, they know what to do and where to go. All right, this one is not very, this one was really hard to find studies about. It's not very, um, it's been studied, but there's not a ton of information on there. This is called um, time compensated sun compass. Um, so there's a moth, um, lots of different lepidopteran species, but one in particular is called the tethered yellow underwing moth. And um, there's several species that do this, like I mentioned, but they use a different orientation cue called a time compensated sun compass. So basically they're looking at the sun, they're changing position of the sun. And I know this isn't night sky, but it's still an orientation cue. Um, it is the best studied example um, in butterflies that basically they roost overnight during their long journeys 
um, from migration. So um, this is one of them. There's a couple other ones. Um, so basically in this study, they were found to use both the moon and the stars as well as the sun. So they found that moths, um, basically what happens is they weren't 100% really great at this. They tended to drift a little from their orientation point, but it wasn't a very huge drift at all. Um, I didn't want to bore you with the, the directional um, degree of anything like that, but it was a very, very small degree that they tended to drift one way or the other. Um, so basically, um, do they not time compensate for those celestial rotations, but they identify the center of a celestial rotation, basically like those indigo buntings did. They look for the rotation in the sky. Um, many more studies need to be done on this. Like I've mentioned, this is just the information that I gathered from a couple of studies that I found. There's not a lot of information on this, but we know that they do it. All right, here's one that is very well studied. Um, we do not have these in Nebraska, if anyone was interested. Um, harbor seals, we don't have them, but they believe that they forage a lot at night, but they don't have any, any terrestrial landmarks. So they wanted to see how they go about finding their way at night. So in 2006, there was a study done in Germany where there was two captive seals, um, and basically they built a floating planetarium just for them, and their names were Nick, and I think it's Matt, I'm not sure, it's something. Um, they were trained basically to swim um, using Pacific or specific load stars. Um, so again, these are stars that are used to guide them like the North Star because they don't move. Um, so basically both of them were able to identify single stars in a realistic projection of the Northern Hemisphere. So they put these um, seals in this planetarium this floating planetarium, they projected a very realistic like night sky uh, picture and they were able to identify certain stars and knew which direction to go. Um, it indicated that seals might actually use specific stars and they don't just look at the rotation like in um, the birds and they don't use the Milky Way like in the dung beetles. They specifically looked at a certain star um, and it was the first study done that showed that marine mammals actually use this. So it was a pretty, um, uh, big study. All right, so that was kind of just a, a few things. That was really all the information that I could find about how animals um, specifically use the night sky. If you know more, please go ahead and put that in the chat. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about the moon. So how animals change their behavior during the moon, um, new moon, full moon, um, and how animals are affected by the moon. We know that the tides are affected and we know there's a lot of other things, but how are animals really affected by the moon? Um, okay. All right, so this is perfect because there's a full moon tonight, so not any better time to do this. Um, but there's a lot of myths that kind of fall into that full moon. You know, you hear more people get in accidents, or you more hear babies are born, or like um, people are just weirder during a full moon. There's a lot of myths, there's strange patterns kind of um, that go around this, but there are some patterns in animal behavior that really are linked to the lunar cycle. So full moons, um, they provide a time cue for synchronized events. They happen at a regular, um, basically once a month, and they happen pretty regularly. Um, it really helps uh, facilitate visual communication at night. So a lot of animals will use the night sky, they will use the moon as a way to orient themselves, but also communicate um, with their um, family, with their prey, with predators, um, and uh, basically, um, <laughs> It's normally scares nighttime animals out into the shadows. So it is uh, normally really dark when they come out and it's brighter than normal and they do not want to come out. So it's different and it, it's interesting how that affects their behavior. All right, so I know we don't have European badgers. This was the information that I really find that was either one, hilarious, or two, just really interesting. So European badgers, they have found, um, they tend to raise their legs up and um, when they pee more often during the new moon than a full moon. Um, so basically European badgers will use this to mark their territory, especially during the time that they're getting ready to mate. Um, so the new moon is a prime time for badger, badger mating, and that uh, basically that increased darkness provides the badgers with more protection. So um, 
Pairs of badgers will usually take up about 90 minutes to mate, so that pea pattern is a practical route in self-defense, which is kind of interesting. And again, I know we don't have European badgers, we have American badgers, um, but it was very interesting. All right, this one I thought was cool too. Um, so I know again, we do not have corals, but there is a certain area off the coast of Australia um, that all the corals usually on moonlit nights in December, they have synchronized themselves and they will release this massive amount of egg and sperm just bloom. And you can actually see it from space. And if you look at pictures of this, it is like this big pink, um, it looks like a big pink algae bloom, um, but basically it is these corals releasing their sperms and their eggs. And there's many factors that they believe contribute to this. It's not just the full moon in December, it's the temperature, it's the salinity or the salt content of the water, the amount of food that they have. But they've also found that every time they do this, it is during a moonlit night. So the event always occurs on or near a full moon. And by synchronizing their time, um, basically that free floating sperm has more likelihood of interacting and fertilizing eggs um, to basically reproduce. So it is a good chance that they will reproduce during this time if there's a massive um, release of sperm and eggs and um, they're likely to more reproduce. So like I said, you can see it from space. And if you look at pictures of it, it's like this big pink algae bloom is what it looks like. All right, um, some of you might have heard of antlions before. Um, they're kind of this weird little, um, they almost look like a bed bug kind of. They look kind of like dragonflies as well, um, but there are little larvae of dragonfly like insects called antlions, but their kind of fun name is a doodle bug, which is a real thing. Um, so these doodle bugs, they will actually scurry around these sand environments and they get their name because when they do scurry, they leave these like winding little doodle paths, like if you would doodle on your um, pictures. Um, so they call them doodle bugs. And what they will do is they will find a spot in the sand, they'll dig this like funnel shaped hole and they sit in there and wait for the prey to fall in and then they grab them. Well, studies have shown that they will dig new traps every single day but during a full moon, they will dig more traps and bigger traps. Um, they believe that the, um, the prey is more active during those full moons and more insects or more little things will fall into their holes. And so they need to make their holes bigger. So usually what happens is this pays off. They eat more during that full moon because they have more prey that they've captured. Um, they believe that the lunar cycle plays a role in this behavior. Um, so they've kind of dubbed it as a, um, just because of the full moon. All right, this one was interesting as well. Um, I know, again, we don't have lions, but we have mountain lions, not anywhere close to the same thing here. But um, when we talk about lions, like I'm talking about Serengeti lions here. So lions will normally hunt at night, um, but sometimes during the times when they hunt after a full moon, they will switch their behavior and hunt during the day. Um, research has kind of found that these animals will consume less food during a moonlit night because prey is less active and there's not enough, not enough food to eat, but less food for them to catch and eat. Um, so during the day, they will change their behaviors because they're hungry. Um, they need to make up those extra calories and basically that extra fuel. So they will hunt the day after a full moon. Usually about two or three days, I read, it kind of goes back to normal. And this is not an every single month occurrence. Um, it, sometimes prey is more active, sometimes prey is less active, but they have correlated that prey is less active during that full moon time. So they are more likely to hunt during the day um, on a new moon rather than um, during a full moon. All right, so that was just a little information about how um, animals use a night sky and how they um, change their behaviors during um, full moons or new moons, and also how they orient themselves in the sky. So, all right, I'm gonna check, no chat. All right, this, and like I said, this one was really hard to find information on. I did my best to find as much Nebraska-based stuff as possible, um, but now I wanna talk a little bit about light pollution. So we talked about how animals use the night sky, 
but how is that changing for them? I'm sure some of us have heard of light pollution before. Maybe you're not really sure what it is. I'm going to tell you here in a second and then tell you how that is affecting animals being able to use the night sky and just animals and people in general and kind of what things we can do to help. All right. So if you're not familiar with light pollution, um, basically less than 100 years ago, you could look up in the night sky and you could see a ton of stars. Um, but with increased and widespread use of that artificial light, it's really impairing not only our views to the night sky, but it's also um, affecting things like the environment and safety and energy consumption and even the health of not only people, but also our ecosystems as well. So many of us have probably heard of things like air and water and land pollution, um, but light can also be a pollutant. The only good thing about I, what I will tell you is that light pollution can be reversible, whereas a lot of times air pollution, water pollution, land pollution is not always so. But basically light pollution is the inappropriate or excess use of artificial light. Um, it can also, like I mentioned, have serious environmental consequences for not only humans, but wildlife as well, and also our climate too. And I'm sure that all of us, when you think about it, you've driven by a building at night um, that has a lot of external artificial lights, or maybe someone leaves the light on when they go to bed and that light spews out into the um, into the street. So we might not seem like that's a big deal, but it can actually really affect a lot of animals. Um, and we'll go about talking about who that affects and why. All right, so what are the components of light pollution? So there's different types of light pollution. There's one called a glare. So this is the excessive brightness that basically causes like a visual discomfort. And I'm sure we've all had a glare or like you've been driving and the light hits your eye at a certain point and you're like, oh my gosh, that glare is so bright. That's what we're talking about. So sky glow is a little bit different. It brightens the sky over basically those inhabited areas. So um, this one is really noticeable at night. Like let's say you're on a plane at night or you're driving at night, you notice that the closer to the city you get, the brighter overall the light gets the glow of the city. And then there's also so called something called light trespass. So this is light falling where it is not intended or needed. So this would be like in the middle of a desert. We're in the middle of the sand hills. Why is the light coming in? And then there's also clutter. This is bright, confusing, and excessive groups of light sources. Have we ever driven by the, <laughs> the one I'm totally thinking of is the one by Wahoo. There's a Ford dealership out there and it's car dealership. And like any car dealerships, there's an excessive amount of light that comes from them at night. And they understand keeping them for keeping it on for certain reasons, but it is like an excessively bright amount of light that does not really need to be there. All right, and then there's also, um, when we talk about light pollution, it's basically just a side effect of industrial civilization. So the more buildings we make, the more people, the more homes there are, there's just gonna be more light. It's just kind of a, a product of that. Um, but any artificial light or um, light pollution can come from exterior and interior lights. Um, we've all seen the big advertising, um, neon glow or the, the billboards that are bright at night, commercial properties, offices, factories, street lights can even be um, light pollution. And um, I'm sure we've all seen like an illuminated sports venue at night. So they get fairly bright. All right, so like I mentioned, like how bad is this? If the lights are on a couple times, if it's really bright, what does that really affect? So overlighting is a international concern. It's not just it affects um, here or there, it is everywhere. Um, so if you live in an urban or suburban area, if you wanna see light pollution, all you have to do is go outside at night and look up at the sky. So they believe that about 80% of the world's population lives under sky glow. So if you remember, sky glow is the brightening the sky over an inhabited area. So I mentioned that if you go traveling and you start coming into a big city, you notice that it's just brighter overall because of that glow from all of the offices and the factories and the buildings. Um, so about 80% of the world lives under sky glow, so that brightened area. In the United States and Europe, about 99% of the public, they cannot experience natural light. So if they go outside to look up, 99% of us are seeing sky glow and we're seeing non-natural light. So what you're seeing up in the sky is the brightest of the bright stars. Um, I'm sure we've all loved going camping and we've gone somewhere where it's really dark and the amount of stars that you see is just 
crazy compared to being in a city or that suburban area. Um, if you're interested in this and everyone that registered, I'll send you a, a resource link to this. But if you wanna see kind of the, um, the spread of light pollution, there's an interactive map that will show and it's called globe at night and you can see that light pollution map as far as the whole uh, United States and the world. Um, basically all of this data was collected um, over eight years um, by citizen scientists so um, if you're not familiar what citizen scientists are, they are people just like everyday people that go out and collect data and then give it to real scientists and so they can figure out what to do with that and kind of how to use that information. So I will also give you information on how you can help as well. All right, so what are the effects of light pollution? Why is this such a big deal? So for three billion years of life on Earth, it consisted of a rhythm of light and dark, and it was created by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now you have artificial lights that are basically overpowering that darkness. It's disrupting the natural day and light pattern and it shifts the balance. Um, so this may seem intangible um, as far as a, a concern, but we're starting to get a growing body of evidence that is showing we have measurable negative impacts of light pollution. So it is everything from increasing our energy consumption. It's disrupting the ecosystem and wildlife. It can harm human health. Um, how many of us um, when we go to bed at night, we um, see a street light outside our window or there's light out there. It's affecting your sleep and that's affecting how people feel. Um, it's affecting crime and safety. It affects every single person in the world. So it's not just those people that live in very bright areas or people that run car dealerships and don't turn the lights off. It affects every single person. All right, so who are these animals that are really, really threatened by light pollution? Well, all animals are, um, but there are a few that are really key as far as they found studies that they're really having negative impacts because of light pollution. So one of them are sea turtles. Um, so sea turtles will hatch, the, the males or females will lay their eggs on a beach, they will hatch, and then the idea is that they will find their way back to the sea by looking at that bright horizon line. Well, now what's happening is they literally see that bright horizon line everywhere and it's kind of stranding them on land because they don't know where to go. Um, so when they're stranded on land, this often leaves them vulnerable to things like dehydration, predators, and even cars. Um, there's been studies done in Florida where alone in just Florida, millions of hatchlings will die every single year because they don't make it back to the sea. Um, they're already an endangered species, let alone now throw in light pollution. Um, another one that little hits more close to home for us is fireflies. Um, we've had a lot of people say that they're seeing less fireflies. Um, yes, you are seeing less fireflies, but another problem is it's so bright you can't see them. So fireflies are dis, uh, disappearing across the globe. It's not just light pollution. Habitat loss is a huge component for them, but also artificial light will interfere with the light that males create to attract those females. So like I mentioned, they're there, but you can't see them. They're not bright enough. So if you can't see them, the females can't see them. So then there's less reproduction. So overall, there are less fireflies being born every single year. All right, another couple animals. Um, we don't have Atlantic salmon either, but they have found that um, in Atlantic salmon, it changes. Um, artificial light will change the natural migration pattern. So they did a study on this where they found that under street lighting, like artificial light, the migration was totally random. They didn't know when to go. Under uh, normal light or natural light, the migration correlated with sunset. So um, again, it's affecting their migration and it can also disrupt um, basically their migratory behavior and their chance of survival. If they're not migrating, they're not getting food, they're not reproducing, they're not spawning, and it's a whole cluster of everything going wrong. Also, another one that we have here in Nebraska, not this photo, this is not one from Nebraska, but we do have a tree frog species. We have Cope's gray tree frogs, but overall tree frogs in general, many of them are nocturnal. So these guys are especially susceptible to harm from light pollution. Um, so artificial light is basically influencing their mating calls. Um, if it's a very high lit area, usually tree frogs are pretty tiny. If they're calling under a bright light, it's like a spotlight for a predator saying, hey, I'm over here, just letting you know. The problem is they less they call, the less females are gonna find them. And they're calling to find those females. So if they aren't calling, the females aren't reproducing. So again, they're really affected by that light pollution. Another one that is close to home, um, monarch butterflies. So they are one of the only 
butterflies that will fly that two-way um, migrati migration pattern. And um, basically, that artificial light, it throws off um, and it makes them deviate from their course. So they get lost, they get hungry, they get tired, they lose too many calories to find their way back to the correct path, and they die. Um, so that's something that is really harmful for them as well. And then lots of bird species. There wasn't just one I could narrow down, um, but many birds will migrate or hunt at night and they use the stars and the moon. Well, if they can't see them, it makes them wander off course. Um, they will also collide with illuminated buildings and towers. Um, they also depend on cues from these properly timed seasonal schedules. Um, so if they're not finding or not seeing those seasonal schedules or it's brighter than normal, it might cause them to migrate too early or it might cause them to miss ideal climate conditions um, for things like going and finding food or nesting or reproduction or any other types of things. So it affects lots of different species, not just um, mammals, not just people, it affects insects and birds and uh, sea turtles, reptiles, all those different types of things. All right, so how can you help? So like I mentioned earlier, light pollution, unlike other forms of pollution, it can be reversible. So each of us can make a difference. Um, it just basically is being aware of this problem. A lot of people have never heard of light pollution. They don't know what it is. They don't know how deadly and how affecting it could be for not only people, but also animals and the ecosystem. Um, there's very specific small things that we can do that really do make a difference. Uh, the first one is get educated. So like I mentioned, a lot of you, you're doing that today. You're here, you're listening, you're not sure what light pollution is, or maybe you've heard of it, but not really sure. You're educating yourselves today. So that's a huge thing. Also, um, use light only when and where it's needed. Um, if you need light to grow your seeds in your basement for your petunias, then yes, put it on. Um, one thing that you can do that helps that it's indoors, close the blinds, make it sure that that light is not escaping out into the ecosystem or outside. Um, also, if safety is a concern, install things like motion detector lights that are only on during certain times and they're on timers and they can shut off during the day. Um, also proper, properly shield all outdoor lights, keep your blinds drawn to keep that light inside, and something that you can do that helps uh, scientists is become a citizen scientist. Um, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, globe at night, this is actually a photo that was taken from a screenshot of a city. So this is all that artificial light that's being projected and they can spread um, very quickly. So basically, if you become a citizen scientist, they have you measure, step outside your house a couple of nights, measure how much light you see, type it into the computer, and there's data right there. So they did that for eight years, and this is kind of the information that they came up with. Um, also spread the word to family and friends. Maybe um, Uncle Carl doesn't really need all his lights out on his property. It's like, hey dude, shut them off at night. Um, it's very, very simple things that we can do that actually make a huge difference. I think that was it. So, all right. So that was a little bit different on my science of today. Like I mentioned, it was really hard to find information, but I hope that you got some good things out of it about light pollution, about how animals use the moon, and then also some things about night sky ecology. So like I mentioned, we'll start again in October. Um, here's the list. Um, I will send out um, to everyone that registered, I will send you an evaluation that if you could fill that out, that would be great. It helps us improve our programming. And also if you fill it out, you can get some swag from us. Um, but I will also send out the next one as well as this list so that you can get them on your calendar. They will be same time, three to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time every Thursday for six weeks. So um, some good topics there, but. Like I mentioned, if you like this, um, we will, we are recording it. We will place it on our Game of Parks Education YouTube channel. I'll have it up by probably noon tomorrow, Friday. Um, otherwise, if you want to visit other ones, we have our whole playlist, Science Of. There's stuff on fungi. There's stuff on geology, lots of different animal topics. There's tons of stuff on there. And then we also have an education Facebook page. We have an education Instagram page. And then also we have our Nebraska Wildlife website where we have free downloadable activities and um, information on there as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, we will see you in the fall. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and see if we have any questions. So <clears throat> it always concerns me when I don't see questions with either I did a really bad job and everyone's confused or um, 
you're just like overwhelmed with stuff. So I'm just going to take it as you're just overwhelmed and got a lot of good uh, information on there. So yes, thank you for talking about light pollution recommendations. Um, there are thousands of satellites reflecting sunlight, which makes ob observing deep sky objects even more difficult. Yes. And David also put in that if you're around at least the Lincoln area in Branched Oak, there's a really cool observatory out there as well. Um, they have events that you can check out too. There's also, um, oh, someone just asked, does Nebraska have any dark sky cities? Um, so we have Merritt Reservoir is uh, considered an uh, international dark sky park, I think is the correct term. And someone please correct me if I'm wrong. And I wanna say that Nebraska was trying to implement another area as well, but I wasn't, I'm not sure which place it is. Um, but if you look up or Google search, and I can put this in the um, resources that I email out everyone to, um, international dark skies, and you can type in like Nebraska and see all the different events or all, sorry, all the different places in Nebraska that are considered um, international dark sky area. So Merritt is one for sure. Um, and they do a ton of events there every single year. Um, but yes, someone said the star party was just two weeks ago in uh, Merritt Reservoir. Yes. Um, do dark sky cities have no artificial light? Um, my guess is, I don't know. I assume I don't even want to say that. I assume no, because it's so hard to not have artificial light. You're using different, um, you're using some type of different light, but I know that there's certain regulations that dark sky event or places have to have, and they have to follow to be considered dark sky, but I'm not sure exactly what those are. So, um, but good question. Yeah, I can look that up and put that in our um, evaluations and our emails as well. So good questions, everyone. Thank you. All right. Well, if that's all that we have, I will let all of you go and we will hopefully see you in the fall. So have a great rest of August and September. So thanks everyone. Ooh, someone said next star party um, next year, July 16th through 23rd. So we can put it on our calendar. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Bye.